Mark chapter 2, we'll look at verses 18 through 22 this morning. In our passage today, we're going to discover that there was a group of uh, religious whiners who followed Jesus around complaining about what he did and what he said. Let me ask you this. Have you ever known anyone that is a chronic whiner? Constantly whining about their health. Constantly whining about the weather. Constantly whining what's going on in Washington, D.C. Do you know someone like that? Now then, here's a harder question. Do you think anybody was thinking about you when I ask <laughs> that question? Mark chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. I'm going to tell you something one of my uh, seminary professors told us when we were studying the Gospels, and we came to an account such as this when Jesus was encountering the Pharisees. Uh, as he got ready to read the passage for that day and to also uh, begin the lecture, he said to us, uh, gentlemen, remember, we're more like the Pharisees than we are like Jesus. So let's see if we see ourselves here. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting and people came and said to him, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come. When the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into an old wine skins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins." But new wine is for fresh wine skins. Now, we've pretty much all already have discovered the Pharisees were, were the professional whiners. They followed Jesus around. They were sort of like the moral police. They were going to criticize everything that he said, everything that he did. And even what we looked at last week, they whined that Jesus hung out with sinners and outcasts at that party that Matthew had thrown. Jesus and his disciples were the party goers, and the Pharisees were the party poopers. So in this passage, they hammer Jesus with another complaint. They whine. John the Baptist's disciples fast, and of course we fast, but you boys aren't very religious. We don't ever see you fasting. I probably could have whined better than that, but I didn't want to make you feel bad. But Jesus took their complaint and responded with three many parables. These parables only have a few words, but I think they have some pretty important truths for us. And the first parable is about a wedding party. The second one is about a patch, and the third one's about the wineskins. First one. The parable says a wedding feast isn't the time to fast. Now, we have already seen John the Baptist's disciples fasted regularly, so did the Pharisees, and they were upset that Jesus' disciples were partying while they were fasting. Now, the Pharisees, they would fast two days a week, and they fasted simply as a way to show other people, look how good I am. I am a good person. I fast twice a week. You see, they weren't fasting for God's sake. They were fasting to be seen by others. Now then, fasting is a very wonderful spiritual discipline. Jesus fasted and prayed often, but it wasn't a ritual designed for others to see. The Pharisees would do it. Uh, they would whiten their faces, make themselves look so poor and, and, and just being uh, so, so hungry, and they would just 
make themselves look so pitiful. And they would, they would pile ashes on top of their hair. And they would, they would moan and they would groan. And so everyone know that they were spiritual. Look, or look over in Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18, what, what Jesus had to say about this. Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. This is his teaching in the uh, Beatitude, in the um, Sermon on the Mount about fasting. He says, when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward, but when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but 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 by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. You know, the Old Testament commanded to fast one day a year. That was Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. But the Pharisees had, had, had taken such a wonderful spiritual discipline and changed it into some sort of a badge of, look how super self-righteous I am. Look how good I am because of what I'm doing. And in, their, in answering their criticism, we see in these verses 18 through 20, Jesus compared himself to the bridegroom. Now, we know from Scripture that His bride is the church. And at this point, the bride hasn't yet been revealed, but she was waiting patiently for her time to make appearance. So Jesus is saying, now, while the party is going on, that's not the time to fast. That's the time to feast. Man, it's, it's when it's all out there. I love doing weddings in Louisiana. Man, we would have some of the best food you ever seen at those weddings. I don't normally like to do weddings. I do wedding receptions very well. <laughs> and this is what Jesus was saying. It's a, it's a time to it's a time to part. It's a time to to rejoice and to be happy. So this is the application. Life is about a joyous relationship with Jesus, not a religious ritual. And that's an important point we need to learn. The Christian life is more like a wedding celebration than a funeral procession. The real issue the Pharisees were addressing was this. It's not fair for you guys to live it up while we endure religion. If you were holy, you would be miserable like us. We had a a church I pastored in Cherry Grove Baptist Church in Mitty, Louisiana. Every fifth Sunday, there's about five of us churches. We would have four or five of us churches. We'd have fifth Sunday singings. And we'd go around to a different church every time. In Cherry Grove, we'd bring about 20 or 25 people to those fifth Sunday singings. And we'd be sitting in part of the church and we're just laughing and cutting up, and all those other people are just looking at us and frowning. Like, what are you doing having a good time in our church? We don't do this in our church. I'm, you know, I'm glad we can laugh here. Because being with Jesus is something that ought to be joy, or something that we celebrate, not some funeral like, or long face like we got shot with sour pickle juice goodness this is what David Dykes has said he pastors in Tyler Texas he said the Pharisees were griping while Jesus was grinning the Pharisees were somber while Jesus disciples were singing the Pharisees were languishing while Jesus disciples were laughing the Pharisees were criticizing while Jesus boys were celebrating the Pharisees were jealous And Jesus' group was jubilant. Let me ask you, which group are you in? Uh, You want to be in the happy group, right? That's where we want to be. You know, even before you came to church today, you had to make a choice about about what clothes you would wear. Now, I say that because, you see, in the same way, you make a choice, a decision every day about your spiritual walk, what your life is going to be like. 
You can wear a garment of praise like we find in Isaiah chapter 61. Or you can carry around a blanket of despair. Joy and praise are gifts from God. And those we celebrate. <clears throat> Our enemy, the devil, comes to kill, steal, and destroy. You know what the enemy wants to do? He wants to kill your joy. He wants to kill your testimony. He wants to, he wants to rob you of your salvation. He can't do that, but he wants to do that. But he, as he tries to do that, he will want to steal the joy of your salvation. Guard it very carefully. Don't let him steal your joy. Don't make a deal with the devil. Celebrate what God has done through Jesus Christ. And then there's a second parable. The new patch will ruin an old garment. Now, we have all kinds of new fabrics today. You go into the stores to buy clothes find all kinds of synthetic fabrics that don't shrink when they're washed. And how many of us like the real stretchy things that makes us more comfortable? In Jesus' time, new cloth would always shrink after the first few times it was washed. So a, pe a person wearing a new garment had to make sure it was a couple of sizes too large so that the garment would shrink down to the right size. By the way, here's a little fashion hint for you, as if I'm a fashion. Uh, the choir's already talking about what I'm wearing today, probably. So, If you want to look like you're losing weight, buy an extra size larger. <laughs> that seems to work, you know. Are you doing okay? Are you losing weight? Yeah, I'm doing good. Then you, my problem is I grow into that size. <laughs> but the garments during Jesus' day, they were often torn or they were moth-eaten, and so they were constantly being repaired. And so if you had an old robe with a hole in it, it would be foolish to sew a new patch on it. Because what would happen when it was washed, the new patch would shrink, but the old cloth would stay the same, and so you'd have rip, it would just rip apart. Back during those days, that was just common sense. It would have ruined the new patch in the old garment. But let's look at the applications Jesus trying to make with this little short parable here. He says, Jesus doesn't just patch up your life. He gives you a new life. As the song the lady sang a while ago, he changes the life that we have. In this parable, the, the old garment was the Old Testament, the old covenant, what we would call the law. And Jesus was saying he didn't just come to improve the old covenant. He came to replace it with something totally new. And there was no way his new covenant could be used to patch up the old one. And the Pharisees were threatened by this because their religious activity was based upon keeping the law instead of living under grace. Some people think they're pretty good and only need Jesus just to patch up some problems in their lives. You know, it's been said that men love duct tape. Someone said that all a man needs to be happy is duct tape and WD-40. <laughs> if it moves and it shouldn't, use the duct tape. If it doesn't move and it should, use the WD-40. But here's the truth we find in this. Jesus didn't come to put duct tape on our hearts. He came to give us a new heart. And when Jesus comes into your life, his goal is not to reform us. His purpose is to transform us. Because every one of us are sinners by nature and by choice. We try to fix the sinful character, and when we try to fix it, it's like sewing a new, unshrunk patch on an old garment. 
In our first birth, the physical birth, we were deformed by sin. That's why Jesus says we need a new birth. We need to be born again. And that's a spiritual change that takes place. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. There was a hillbilly mom that had nine or ten children. And one of her boys fell down on a new blacktop road and was covered in tar, and he was a mess. And his mother had him outside trying to clean that sticky tar off of him, and she said to him, I just declare, Tom, it would be easier just to have another one than to clean you up. (laughs) That's like us. Jesus doesn't try to clean our hearts old hearts up he gives us a new heart the third parable new wine will crack old wine skins well today wine is put into bottles but in Jesus time wine was most often stored in goat skins the uh, These skins were removed, they were scraped clean on the inside, and then they were tanned over a fire. They were then stitched back together again with the neck of the goat skin becoming the neck of the wine skin. And that fresh wine skin would be soft and would be very supple. And when new wine was poured into it, of course, in the fermentation process, gas would be released and uh, it would stretch to accommodate the new expansion there and remember we talked last week about how Jesus used humor that we don't really get in the 21st century that's just the kind of way it was then and he's telling this parable and it's sort of a humorous parable because Jesus is insinuating only an idiot would put new wineskin and an old wineskin. And I imagine the rest of the disciples were sitting there. They were sort of elbowing each other saying, yeah, I've heard this one before. Listen, listen to this one, what he tells them. An old wineskin had already expanded. It hardened from its original supply of wine. So it stopped expanding. It becomes rigid. And to, these, to this audience, at least to the disciples, it's not so much to the Pharisees, it was very hilarious to imagine the result of pouring new wine into an old wineskin. Because over a period of just a few days, there would be that audible sound as the hardened skin began to crack and to split. That wine was expanding. The old skin was too rigid to change its shape. The old skin couldn't stretch because it had become inflexible. And soon the stitches would start to pop. Now what's Jesus teaching here? He says, beware of a hardened heart that refuses to accept new revelations of truth from the Word of God. The religious whiners of Jesus' day didn't like his teaching because it was so revolutionary. It was new to them. He said things they never heard before. His new teaching shocked and offended them. The religious leaders could not handle this new wine Jesus were offering. They were like the inflexible old wine skins. Their attitudes were, if it's new, it can't be true. Every time Jesus said or did something new, you could almost hear the sound of straining and stretching until pop. So what did they do? They killed the messenger instead of accepting the message. We know, because we know who we are as people, human nature rebels against the idea of any things that seems to threaten the good old days and the good old ways. Our motto is, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And using this parable, Jesus compares that attitude to an old wineskin, and what he's actually saying is, if you don't fix it, you're going to break. 
We just saw a video about Travis Kearns in Salt Lake City. One of, part of the mission movement we have today, part of what I'm involved in in my other roles. In this modern mission movement, even though we have the Great Commission and all these uh, Acts 1-8, for years and years and years, this modern mission movement wasn't launched until 200 years ago. There was, uh, at the time of, of that, sending Christian missionaries to other countries was radical. There was this young English shoemaker named William Carey. And he began to study the maps that Captain Cook had drawn and had been published. And as he studied those maps, he became burdened for the millions of people in those lands that he was looking at for them to know Christ. So he became a minister. He began to study foreign language. He went to a religious convention, and he dared to stand up and ask this question. Is the Great Commission binding on us to take the gospel to foreign nations? And an older minister stood up and rebuked him, saying, Sit down, young man. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he will do it without your aid or mine. It was like pouring new wine into an old wineskin. William Carey traveled anyway to India to share Jesus. And today, practically, I think every missionary considers William Carey the father of modern missions. What Jesus was doing with these Pharisees, as William Carey was doing with those folks years ago, he was addressing an attitude that resisted change or anything new. And we all have a tendency, including myself, to reject new idea or new revelation of truth because we like the old way too much. And this was the Pharisees' attitude, and it's an attitude we need to guard against. Like an old, stiff wineskin, our hearts and minds can sort of calcify until we become so inflexible that we can't accept change. Over in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7, 8, and 9, the Bible issues a very strong warning to us about the danger of a calcified or a hardened heart. Hebrews 3, verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. When the Israelites were faced with the new idea of going into Canaan and taking the land, they said, no, we like the old wine better. And God said, okay. Then you're going to take another, wrap, another lap around Mount Sinai. And another, and another, and another. For 40 years, they wandered in the old paths, eating the same old manna. Simply because they refused to accept the new wine of God's plan. So let me close this morning. Let me ask you this question. What kind of a person are you? Are you, are you like an old wineskin? Is things got to be done, done just certain ways? Or it's got to be just this like this or it's not right? Or, or you, have you come to the point in your life where he says, you know what, I'm not going to change about anything. I'm going to stay just the way I am. By the way, we live in a culture, in an age of change. How many still get up out of your chair and go turn the knob on your television to get to the right channel? Hmm. How many of you still carry around the old bag cell phones? Remember those things? Weighed 10 pounds. And we thought we were something. My first cell plan, 30 minutes for $30 a month. And I thought I was on top of the world. We live in a time of change. 
Are you flexible or are you inflexible? What's God saying to you this morning? Do you need to stop acting like the Christian life is a funeral and start celebrating? Because you know what, folks? We are a spouse to a bride and groom that is coming back one day. Do you need to stop trying to patch up your old life and allow Jesus to put on a new robe of righteousness on you? I want you to know this morning there's plenty of new wine that Jesus is providing. Take a look at your own, at your spiritual walk. Have you stopped growing or are you growing in your walk with God? Have you stopped changing? Here's what I think Jesus is saying to us today as his followers in a world that changes in front of us every, every day. Let's be new wineskins. Let's be flexible. Let's, let's be willing to be molded and shaped by Jesus. And if you kind of have a Pharisee attitude, your response would be, well, why would I do that? Because Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain, but he has washed it white as snow. That's why. He wants us to be flexible to be used by him. That means maybe at the end of October, instead of you coming and sitting in a comfortable chair in Green Valley Baptist Church, you're going to be over in Mexico building a house for someone who needs a home. It may mean that you're going to be doing some things that you ever, never thought you would ever be doing in your life at your age. God wants us to be used, be flexible enough to be used by him. And we need to do that because he paid the price for our salvation. In just a moment, Brother Ron's going to come and lead us in hymn number 305, Jesus Paid It All. And then we invite you this morning, if this for the very first time you're beginning to understand something about what Jesus wants in your life and you have never yet made that commitment to trust and to follow him for, for the rest of your life and into eternity, you never ask him to save you from your sins, we invite you to do that today. I'll be at the front. There will be some others that can greet you and pray with you. Or maybe this morning you're a Christ follower. You're a Christian. You're a member of this church. And you're beginning to think, you know, I need to, I need to be more flexible than I am. I've, I've kind of grown crusty in, in my thinking. And God, I want, to be, I want to be flexible. I want to be used by you. I don't want to be that person that's put on the sidelines it may be that you're simply going to be a mighty prayer warrior that God's going to use you in, in ways that you never understood there's no telling what God can do when we begin to say yes to him maybe this morning you're looking for a church home and you'd like to understand more what that means what it looks like we would invite you to come and share that with us there's some connection cards if you don't want to come forward this morning, I know we're kind of a scary bunch, but we invite you to come. If you don't want to do that, just fill out that connection card. There's decision boxes you can check, and just give that at the Welcome Center as, uh, as you leave today. They'll be right out in the foyer. You want to be new wine and a new wine skin. That's what Jesus wants. He wants us to be happy. He wants us to be joyous. He wants us in a position that we can be used by him. Is it for us? No, it's for his kingdom's sake.
and that's what it's about. Let's stand together as Ron leads us. Hymn number 305.